First of all, we wanted to talk to a little bit about um, your, your technical specs, like what kind of camera, kind of lens, kind of numbers of days shooting, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Who's sure. going to go first? Sure, I can start. <laughs> uh, we're shooting for uh, 15 days, um, so we go into uh, the last week of Jones and tomorrow uh, until Friday, and uh, we are shooting on an Alexa Mini. Um, I'm forgetting the lenses. I know our DP had them delivered like just days before the shoot started. And then, yeah, we have a you know a crew of about 30 to 35. It sort of fluctuates. And um, yeah, it's all, it's all working somehow. Um, so we shot our whole thing on just a, like a, just a Panasonic GH5, so like a really cheapo camera, really, um, with a bunch of old, like, Lomo anamorphic lenses. Um, we shot for about 27 days um, on ours, and it was a crew of, like, 15 people. Uh, hi. We, uh, we shot on these cameras called the Kinefinities, which probably uh, most people don't know. Um, it's this camera from uh, China that we use on a 3D film, um, so we just... They shoot 4K, and uh, we just recycled them from the last film we did. Um, and we shot uh, for 12 days, and uh, we had a crew, I think, about 60 to 70. Yep. Two, two cameras? Uh, two cameras, yeah. How, how does, what's it like to do that? <laughs> I want to try that. Well, if you talk to my DP, it'll be a different story. If you talk to me, it'll be a different story. Is it uh, faster, though, or is it not really? Uh, in some situations, it's faster, and in other situations, uh, it depends on your space. The biggest thing we learned was the using two cameras in location space, what worked and what didn't work. Uh, we shot mainly on the Red Weapon Helium 8K, but we also shot on cell phones, webcams, uh, Canon 5D, HVX. Um, no film, but uh, that's all right. Maybe next time. Mm -hmm. uh, we shot for 15 days. That doesn't include the days that... Uh, Rhett and I ran around with cell phones, uh, so maybe 18 <laughs> days. <laughs> uh, crew was like 14, and um, yeah, I think that was it. I missed it. Anything? Do we want budget? 200K. Okay, uh, those of you that missed your budget number, we'll go back to that. <laughs> a jillion. Okay, uh, so we shot 16 days. We used a Canon C300 and Canon uh, Cine Prime lenses. Uh, we had a crew of between 15 to 20, depending on the day, but most of the time it was about 15. Our budget was 160, all in. That includes a, like marketing as well, like cradle to grave. And um, I'm really proud of the opening sequence. We actually did shoot. I shot a lot of that on 16 millimeter and 8 millimeter, and then I did a transfer of 16 millimeter with some of the digital elements that I shot. So that first part that you saw was all 16 millimeter transfer. Did you drop your budget in there, Matt? I can't remember. No, I didn't. Uh, okay. we're, we're, right now it's 300 <laughs> to get us through production. We'll see how the rest goes. Uh, yeah, so the budget for Ever Cadavers was 280. Uh, we were around five to 600, and we used uh, Canon Cinema Primes to shoot on. Okay, well, that's, an, that's interesting. So we're all sort of in the same, same range-ish, so that's great, and making great product. I mean, honestly, it was fabulous. But looking back over your project, um, what are the things that you might not do again or the things you would be sure to do again? Uh, yeah, what, what I wouldn't do again. Um, well, working with unions is always tough for me um, as I'm kind of... Uh, you know, impulsive. And <laughs> so I make a lot of last minute decisions. And uh, I, I just wish we had have just had one producer solely on dealing with unions, um, just because my brain doesn't work that way. So when a financial or agreement question comes at me, when I'm trying to stage a fight scene, I just uh, put it off and pass the buck. So I just really wish that I had uh, just hired someone mainly to do administrative union paperwork. Um, yeah, especially since we ended up going a little over budget on our actor line item, so. <laughs> It's all right, though. Our performances are worth it. Yeah, I think that um, we would definitely... I would, would wish that we had a more active producer contact during post-production, so a post-production supervisor would have been amazing. Because um, that was... All of us were first-time producers, so... I mean, the next project, we won't all be first-time producers, so we'll be much better. But I think going forward, if there's a first-time project, having all first-time producers, regardless of having mentorship, is really tough. Because we all learned... And although we all tried to help each other out, a lot of the mistakes that we made, like just one person with even a little bit more experience could have helped 
all of us rather than all of, like the blind leading the blind in a circle sometimes. Just, and that didn't happen often, but it happened occasionally. So a good piece of advice for that is just to get an experienced mentor uh, on your project or just find someone who's really good at that paperwork and just pay them a lot so you don't even have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would echo the same thing because like it, I relate so much to the sentiment of like you're on set and you're trying to direct a scene or make creative decisions and suddenly there's a whole bunch of logistical questions and you're like, how, how can I divert my energy. So I think definitely in our project too, having somebody to look at the logistical stuff um, would have helped us loads. But as first time producers, it sounds like loads of us, um, that's like next time around something I would really go after. I, I um, This better be good, man. There's, yeah, this is going to be boring. It's locations. Um, locations are such a linchpin for, for everything uh, when it comes to shot listing and just knowing where, you know, where you're going to be and how you can set up your days and your schedule. We have an amazing locations manager named Murray Ord, who's a legend in, in Alberta and uh, has done an incredible job for us. But we just got to it later than we should have. And because there are, uh, because there are so many things hanging on that, I would, that would be my, my piece of advice is try to get to locations and lock them down weeks, months before if you can? Uh, I would probably say, uh, looking back, knowing our market, knowing where um, your project's gonna go. Um, I think a lot of films just get made um, and you may not have time to think about it as to where you want it to go, where you want it to play, but uh, just doing a bit more, um, yeah, due diligence on, on that side, especially when we changed it, because originally the film uh, had nothing to do with Christmas. Um, and you can see there was a little bit of Christmas in the movie when you saw it. Um, so just, just understanding uh, where, yeah, where your project can end up and who you want to see it and where you want it to go at the end. Uh, just to give a little uh, context to Matt, Matt is uh, going in next week to the Calgary Film Centre. Great is location, your, great location. Is your set built? Is it built now? It's, it's coming together right now. I was in there today laying floor and uh, painting. Excellent. That was all right. Just wanted to know. Yeah, as part, of the, as part of the grant process, we've been uh, trying to help with uh, some areas of mentorship and um, support for how to write reports and, and, and also in-kind support, like use of the film center. But Matt was the only project that, that actually needed an interior build in that way, so we're delighted to be able to do that. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and I, I should mention just that our project, I think maybe I'm wrong, but it might be the only one that was granted funding in both of the two years of the Project Lab. That is um, correct. Where we got um, some development funding and, and then were supported into production. So um, so thankful and appreciative. But it, it, like you said, uh, Doug Steeden, uh, you, you connected us and a few other folks with Doug yeah, Steeden yeah. and that, that was invaluable. That kind of uh, support is great as well. You know. Great. Any other, any other of you have any, any comments on that in that way? The, through the process? Oh, I, I actually wish we would have, uh, if I would have had my shit together, um, I would have known we could have built the bakery um, and that would have made our lives easier because shooting in, even though we had a closed down bakery, but the space there was just, uh, it, I, the crew was so excited to get out of there. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and then just going back and watching um, all the stuff that didn't make in the movie and watching what did, we could have built something and just, uh, decked it out. Uh, so that was, yeah, something I ended Timing up Timing is always hard. Yeah. I yeah. mean, obviously this works out right now because we're in between large productions so we can offer this kind of support. And I know when we talked, Dylan, it was yeah. like, I'm not sure, what, what's your dates? And then your dates kept moving and then it just was an Im impossible thing yeah, yeah, for yeah. the length of time that you needed. So definitely getting the pins in the, you know, get them in the ground, you know, exactly when they are, get the hold in the calendar. Really, do It really does help. Yeah, it really does help. And Aaron, was the second part of the question, what did you do that you would do again? Was that? Uh, give or, me a take or am I hallucinating? For, no, I, we sent you the question. <laughs> <laughs> I think I remember that being part two. So, what would be so the things we shouldn't you only would talk do about or what would we not do. Yeah, That's a good point. We what do we do right? We should so talk we about what we did here. right. Um, what I think I did right is on this budget, I, uh, I love practical makeup effects. And uh, I have a long history of experimenting with them in my short films. And so in the script, I intentionally wrote effects that I knew that we could do and that I had done before and I knew how to properly block so that 
those wouldn't be a little raggedy um, just because uh, your first feature is not really the time to experiment with new processes too frequently as there's much more on the line than your three minute short that you made before that. So um, I, I just, uh, I, I, I'm going into production on a new short film and uh, I really love being able to use these short films to experiment with techniques or processes that I want to use in feature films. So kind of like failing in a safe environment, I guess is a way to put it. There are two things that I would do again for sure. Well, maybe three. I loved workshopping with the actors and I wish I had more time to do that. We had um, two workshop, or just one workshop day and it was so great to like break the ice and um, block things out ahead of time. But I also had um, an amazing first AD. Like I can't believe the luck that we had in getting her and we had a one month uh, pre-production period that I had never gone through before and I thought it was like a waste of time. Turns out it was the best investment ever and I can't and I would strongly suggest everybody does this like one month like treat it like a professional project so she treated it as if it was like Winona Earp or Fargo for that first month ahead and that made um, our 16 days of production really smooth. Um, the last thing is we thought about music right from the very beginning so we um, engaged with our composer like in the application process so she was like, she knew what was going on. We talked a lot. And I think that enabled us to actually use like real performers. So we got like people who played for the Calgary Philharmonic and like a folk musician from Vancouver to play on the soundtrack. And I think that our score sets us apart from other indie projects because the quality of that sound was developed like so far in advance that it wasn't just, um, we had the time to make it something really special as opposed to an afterthought. So those are the three things I would do again. Yeah, I'm sensing that. Yeah, it's a very nice, it's fabulous soundtrack. And that, that, that thought process, that intention ahead of time really does show. I know that uh, everybody is very passionate about what they do and they're very committed and dedicated, but I have a feeling like the number of curveballs that come at you in that month and a half ahead or two months ahead or even from the time you put your application in to the time that you're, we're actually giving you the funding, a whole lot of pieces change. So how, how does that sit with you? How do you manage all of those through all of those details if you have other jobs or other commitments and other things? Because it sounds like you might have cleared your plate, Jillian, for uh, well ahead of this project. Uh, I cleared my plate like with time or? Yeah, with time, time and energy. <laughs> uh, well, we had been in the application process. I want to be like totally transparent, like the Calgary Film Center, we were successful at, but I had done a number of applications and was unsuccessful. So. Um, through those rejections, we learned how to adjust our project to be more palatable to funders. Um, and also changing the script, when things came up, they're like, absolutely, like, so the intro sequence in my film, people were very concerned that that was unattainable and that I couldn't do that. So then I actually did a proof of concept for that intro scene, just to show people, like, I'm not crazy, like, it's totally possible. Um, so yeah, I mean, I cleared my plate, but also like, things were really hard this is like the hardest thing ever, and we had a great team. Like my producers, I couldn't do it without them. So uh, that I think that is the takeaway. Like you want to be a director, but like having like badass producers is like badass producers are necessary, and you want to be friends with them, and you want to be like close with them, and get right like comfy. So yeah, that's that's the key. They definitely have a very important role to play. Let's give a hand to all the producers that are here. <laughs> Uh, so for us, um, we uh, for our pre-sales, uh, that's where the idea of uh, changing, uh, taking out Grand Prix and putting Christmas in, that's where um, that came from. And uh, so it was kind of uh, you're shifting your project to work with the funding um, to get it at the level that you want, but you're also trying to retain uh, what you can. So I think that's uh, one of the biggest uh, learning curves uh, for uh, for me as a director, but I think most directors, um, yeah, when you go through, you try to find the balance um, as to how, to how to make it work in both worlds, so, yeah. Um, I think for us, the biggest juggling thing was that initially our thing got funded as a web series, and of course we still had to deliver it as a series, but when we found out that we um, had had this grant from you guys, it's like, okay, now suddenly we have to look at this thing that we've been developing as a series into like these very specific chunks, um, like all these episodes with a through line, how, um, how do we combine those into a feature where it doesn't feel like we have all these really awkward act breaks? Because um, yeah, suddenly you have something that has to flow 
end to end. Um, when our, our show, because it's about a group of friends on a trip, um, each episode is very uh, like focused on one person and kind of like, what are they going through here? Now, okay, now like, what, what's the next person? Um, so there's a lot of shuffling um, and it really helped us to have a lot of uh, like writer mentors and a lot of people like in a writer's room um, to talk about this. So I'm, I'm not sure if it's the way to go or if I would ever recommend trying to make a show more than just like one thing, like make it a show or make it a feature. Um, I'm still <laughs> deciding what, <laughs> um, if that was a, I don't know, not a mistake, but a, a learning process. Right. Um, but I'd say just like get, getting as many people involved with that as opposed to just like thinking about it myself or just like with me and another producer, um, getting all the writers involved and like the production design people and stuff like that um, helped smooth that transition from series to feature, but it's been interesting. Have you seen Scenes for a Marriage or Pola X? No. Okay, definitely check out both of those. They're like incredible features that were also made into miniseries, like at the same time. Cool. Totally Sweet. watch them. Okay, we'll do. <laughs> we'll know. <laughs> so I know I, it, you're leading me into the, this next part because it sounds like it was a little bit of a happy accident that you got funding from us <laughs> to make it into yeah. a feature because you hadn't initially thought about that. So just just going on that, and to, if, if we can have some like set stories or things like that, what was the best or or most tragic happy accidents on your sets? I got one. It was um, interesting, not tragic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's an action. Sorry, I should tell you a bit about what my movie is. It's called Red Letter Day. It's a satirical thriller. It's about what happens in an isolated suburban community. Um, when every one of the neighbors receives a letter instructing them to kill one of their neighbors before they kill them. So uh, some people don't do anything, some people do way too much. Um, but it's kind of like a Twilight Zone microcosm of uh, what's going on in the world right now. Um, but also very funny and quite gory. So uh, speaking of gore, uh, we had an action scene where someone's trying to break into someone's home and in the script, um, the character was supposed to throw their body against the door to prevent it from opening and get a drill, spoiler alert, get a drill bit uh, through the side. And then when I, we got there on the day, it turned out the door opened the other way. Uh, <laughs> so uh, luckily I practiced mindfulness and I went and sat down and I said, what is the problem? And I said, why am I feeling like this? And then I worked through it. And uh, the gag we came up with is even better in my opinion because now that the door opens outwardly, the character has to grab on to the door handle. Um, and, you know, luckily for me, there's a guy with a drill on the other side. So uh, that drill goes through the door handle and bites the dude in the hand. And our effects team was able to just whip up quite a gnarly hole in the hand on the spot. And uh, it's actually some people's favorite part of the movie now. So I was pretty stoked on that. <laughs> the, the van that we used on the road trip was, it's like a 1976, uh, like, Dodge thing that one of our producers got more or less, um, I don't know if, it, I don't think it was sketchy, <laughs> um, but <laughs> it's a really, it's a really old van and it probably never should have worked to begin with, um, but uh, two weeks into production, um, one of the like, uh, one of the things in the engine, uh, one of the like gaskets blew or something and went through the oil reservoir and all the engine oil fell out onto the highway um, and then it was like $5,000 to repair it and there was no way that this van was ever gonna run again. And we had like the bulk of our van scenes to shoot ahead of us. Um, so the guy, uh, the guy who um, we were using uh, his property and um, my, my wife's mother's property, they had like kind of like a warehouse space there. Um, we like scrambled over the weekend and sourced like a winch and stuff and then actually came up with a like properly safetyed uh, process trailer for the rest of the shoot, so we were able to drive the van around on a process trailer for the rest, which is something we totally should have thought of from the beginning. <laughs> um, but it made the rest of that easy, if not tragic, for you know uh, wide shots of the van driving around. But it worked out in the end. Good, glad to hear that. Mine is not that <laughs> engineered. <I'm, laughs> that's impressive. Um, no, ours was just on the final day of shooting. Uh, we were at Ranchman's, and we. We really only went with Ranchman's because it's one of the only places that you can get a mechanical bull. And I knew I really wanted to have this mechanical bull scene. But then it turns out like our clearance for stunts wasn't, 
Our, our insurance for stunts was denied at like six in the morning on the day that we were shooting. So Robin, our producer, had to be on the phone with like insurance and ACTRA, because ACTRA was like, we are so sorry, like this was not supposed to happen. They had to find us a stunt coordinator like that day to come in, otherwise we just couldn't shoot that stuff because we weren't covered. It just, I can't believe that it happened, but basically Robin worked for like 10 hours from like five in the morning until we actually shot it and then the clearance came through like right away. But that's what I mean about badass producers because I couldn't be there to like be on the phone with these people when I had to direct like four pages worth of stuff to lead up to that. And I think like it worked out. It would have been really sad not to have some like hot chick like falling off of a bull, <laughs> right? It would have been a shame. <laughs> Somebody mentioned the you mentioned the first AD, and that's such such an important role um, on any set. And um, Kyle Cooper is our first AD right now, and and sort of the, his you know experience and, and knowledge and brilliant scheduling combined with the film center, uh, allowing us to you know we just changed our days. We just switched two days. Uh, what we were shooting on Tuesday, we're shooting tomorrow now. Um, and so yeah, the, I mean I mean we have that flexibility because we've got a great AD and we've got a great space to to make that work, so that, that gives us a lot of freedom. It's, it's amazing, um, you know, Scott was in the, working on the set build, and we're all so used to just having to live with the locations that we have, and he was just like, oh, can I move this door, like, over here for this shot I have in mind? And, and Dean, our set builder's like, yeah, of course. It's like, whoa, you can control the world, you can control the universe, you don't have to live with exactly, so that's very cool, yeah. Yeah, that's the value of building in the stu studio. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Project Lab process. I mean, we generally, the last two years, have had been able to announce in, in the springtime in March and then have, like, it's literally only open for about a month. I think we had closing right at the end of March, both years. And then we try to announce by May. In that process, we have a jury of about between 7 and 9 or 11, so obviously always an uneven number of people from all aspects and all over the pro province that come together and look at it. Um, I want to bring forward just Jillian's project here because she put forward a number in her, in her uh, request, in her submission, and the jury felt that it, she hadn't asked for enough for post-production, and the jury gave her an additional amount for post-production. So I'm going to ask you, Jillian, the value of that extra amount for post-production. It, it was great. Uh, knowing that we had that amount, then we could actually change. We could expand our production knowing that we had the extra cushion of money. So... Um, you know, what we originally asked for, we were prepared to do that, but then knowing that we had additional money that said, okay, this opens a door that otherwise we weren't going to approach. So uh, more money is always more better. <laughs> <laughs> always. Do you have a question? Yeah, just uh, we haven't touched on post-production. Has anybody got anything they would like to share regarding their process? Uh, well, yeah, I just want to give another sh shout out uh, to the Project Lab as um, that funding allowed it so that we could do one more pass on the film. Um, with a supervising editor, uh, John Gerbecki, who has edited all of Guy Madden's films, and uh, it really gave our film an extra polish that's, uh, you know, blowing me away. Um, so, I, the, just never stop editing, I guess, until you have to. <laughs> but it's like, I thought the movie was locked, and then we had a little more money to play with, and I was like, what if we just tried a little something different? And now, uh, I love the movie, to I mean, not twice as much, but... A little bit more, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like, so our, our show being a superhero show, there was a lot of um, pretty, like, crazy effects that the writers had, had written in. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, same, same with us. We had a portion of our grant dedicated to post-production. Like, there's a, there's a character you saw in the trailer who glows for, like, 60% of the film, um, which is, like, a nightmare effect. <laughs> to do um, and uh, being able to go to like some of the local production houses in town to get um, to get like our visual effects done and our color grading done um, and then to break off our sound design our our sound our sound design guy um, Ty Frederick is great he was going to do uh, he was totally willing and able to have like the entire burden of post sound dumped on him um, and he was like he was stoked about it and so we were like okay that's that's great, um, you got this. But once we found out we had that, we were able to um, get like a dialogue editor and then dedicate some stuff to Foley and, and, and things like that. And that really 
has changed the like the sound of the film. Uh, been way better for him, and it's something I will definitely uh, like pursue from uh, now on. Is just like the more people you can get in post, uh, the better. I think usually you try and get a lot of people for like production, um, and just like a couple people for post. But I think you can have just as just as many there. What was your um, most surprising challenge? Any of you? Oh, Dylan, do you want to? Oh, jump sure. In? Yeah. yeah, this was the uh, first project that we had um, an editor editing along as we were shooting, and that was so invaluable just to see uh, how everything was coming together, what we were missing. Um, and then after that, uh, I was able to step back and just let them put their first cut together without really any uh, insight for me. And it was it's great like uh, to see someone else just taking something and imagining it how they see it without your influence. And then you can always go back in and do that. I think directors can sometimes be a little uh, uh, scared to, to do that um, because you know you have it in your head or you're working with an editor and you're just kind of giving them everything and you don't give them uh, the freedom to just kind of see what they see. And uh, the film is yeah, we, a lot stronger um, because there was things that I didn't see or ways to put things together uh, that were allowed to happen. So I think that's, yeah, if, if you can, have that happen while you're uh, editing, while you're shooting, and having someone else alongside is a you know, helpful thing. Thank you. It's just for the surprising challenge, the challenge that you underestimated that caught you off guard. Drone permits. <laughs> Utter nightmare. Um, but we did secure them, and as a part of that, you have to let the entire community know uh, that you're filming with a drone in their neighborhood which I actually believe alerted the busybodies to gather around and judge us even more harshly, because it was a Tuesday at 10 a.m. I don't think anyone would have known or given a crap. Uh, <laughs> yet, uh, when we got the permit, we had to let everybody know. And uh, there was this one person in particular that did not like the fact that we were in her neighborhood and came up with some very nasty lies about us. But luckily, we had, everybody has a camera in, our, in their pockets, so we were able to show who the true villain was in that situation. <laughs> World star. <laughs> Post-production was the biggest kick in the ass. Yeah, because it is possible with smaller projects, like I've done web series and um, music videos, like where I would do all of the post-production myself, and this is the first time I engaged with professionals outside of like myself as editor everything. And um, that was a huge learning curve. Um, go, shifting from a music video production style or a web series production style to a feature film production style is um, quite, there are a lot of similarities, but moving from short form post-production to a feature length post-production, I had to learn a lot about how to be respectful to that process. And um, yeah, that was a big, that it kind of blew, blew me away how hard it was I'm so thankful that like we had a good team to stick with us, but um, yeah, you, you can't do everything yourself. So I co-edited the film, and I'm so happy I did. Like I love editing; it's like one of my favorite parts. And I think if I can, I think I'm a good editor, <laughs> like for other people's projects as well. So if you're looking, um, no, but but honestly, like I can't being an editor and then being a director and also being a producer and then also going into the sound edit. Like it became too much, and so engaging with more people um, is, I think, a good suggestion. Baking. Uh, we severely underestimated <laughs> baking <laughs> and the challenges <laughs> that uh, happen in a, I have so much respect for those cooking shows, reality shows you see, uh, because just the sheer uh, idea of having to create in the stages of building um, the scenes of like something, someone baking, what do you, what do you actually see? And uh, if they're supposed to be experienced, I never thought of, you know, maybe the, our actors aren't as experienced bakers as uh, they thought. <laughs> and uh, so when one's supposed to be professional and what they're doing looks good to me and then I had someone else come on set and be like, that, nobody would do that. And I'm like, well, I guess that's fair. My baking skills aren't the greatest. So, uh, so yeah, just dealing with... Um, the production design side of the film, on, on specifically the baking, was uh, underestimated uh, on our side. And um, um, fortunately, we had a, a lovely team that was able to keep up. And uh, um, yeah, we used their hands in place. That was one of the things we ended up doing for some of the stuff uh, that needed to be super, super specific. Um, yeah, baking. I'd say, um, like, 
road trip films are fun, but uh, it requires you to go so far all the time. Um, so I think like almost every, with the exception of like five or six days, every single day on set was like a travel day for the crew. Um, so like trying to organize that logistically and like permits um, and yeah, even even just like how do you like how do you reimburse people for this? Like where do you where do you put them if you're on a like location for multiple days and it's not safe for anyone to drive home because it's so late? Like that kind of thing. Um, that could be that became like I, I didn't say I wouldn't say it became a nightmare because we had enough like for planning for it, but very uh, it's very it's very difficult to do that. Um, so that's probably the most difficult thing to organize for our show, besides the van breaking down. Uh, I would definitely say delegation from the perspective of a, of a producer. Um, you'll, 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 you'll probably have like a, you know, a great day on set and things will be going wonderfully and then um, somebody will be like, oh, what's, uh, who's gonna take all these trays from the, the caterers um, from lunch today? Or, uh, oh, we're staying in this location, we wanna leave our gear um, who's going to stay here overnight to make sure that nobody, nothing gets stolen, um, and so on and so forth. And if you don't delegate those tasks to someone, crew's gone home, and it's you. It's you. You're, you're the one. Uh, you're, and I s slept in a bar uh, one night. <laughs> uh, which was kind of cool. Uh, I, s I slept on a, on a like a, a one of those booth. Uh, it, it was and it was all right. Uh, but but you know I had to keep the gear safe and it meant saving overtime. And so, um, so, but my point being, delegation is the key tool of a producer. So you have to make sure that you know if if you're not the one doing it, you've delegated it to someone else. Otherwise, it's just going to come right back at you. So as it should. It's Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so we titled this session Everything You Want to Know About Making a Micro-Budget Feature in Alberta. First, I want to just ask the panel here about how you feel about the joys and challenges of making a micro-budget feature in Alberta. Do you have any comments on it? This What's it my, like? This is my third micro-budget feature, and I want it to be my last. <laughs> oh, uh, it's why? Sim it's simply not enough money, <laughs> um, okay. es especially if you're trying to make uh, genre movies as I am. Um, to stand out in the international marketplace these days, you either need a super high concept that you deliver um, with great skill or a recognizable face, and uh, both of which cost quite a bit more money. However, I would not turn down another micro-budget film. It would just be more people talking and less people stabbing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I agree. I think that micro-budgets are an excellent, like, you need them. I, I know that Telefilm Talent to Watch calls their program a right to fail because there's very few opportunities to make a jump from like a $10,000 music video into a $1 million budget, and oftentimes you won't get that opportunity unless you can prove that you are uh, trustworthy with a budget. So, you know, going into the $100,000 range or multiple hundred thousands, um, an amazing opportunity, but it, there are limitations with it. It's extremely exhausting. It's a personal investment from the director and producing team. Uh, you don't get paid very much, and so as a sustainable way to continue to make a, a career, I don't think it's possible. But as a stepping stone into uh, recognition, to get an agent, to um, try and become a director for hire, or to actually say, okay, hey, now that I've done this $160,000 project, you can trust me with double that, and I can uh, deliver. That's undeniable. So I think when you approach the micro budget, you milk it for absolutely everything, but know that there's there is something beyond that. And you have to like see the vision of yourself beyond this step. So it's like th this this is the first step, the one of the most important steps into a long highway of a career. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well said. Uh, I, I don't think I don't think the problems we have uh, change at all. Uh, you, the, more, the more you go up in budget, these same problems just manifest in different ways. Um, it's never enough money. Um, if you look at Canadian features as a whole, they all struggle with these same issues. They're just dealing with bigger numbers. Um, and anyone you look at, people looking at us who've made $10,000 uh, short films are saying, this is crazy, I would kill for that much money. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think the, the, um, the situations that we all uh, deal with, they, don't, they, uh, they really don't change uh, with the more money you get. It makes it easy, some things easier, um, but usually, uh, especially if you're creatively driving it, whether you have a $1 million uh, project or a $100,000 project, you're still putting your wage, everything in there to make it as best as possible to jump to the next step. You're always looking at jumping, so um, 
I think everyone always strives to go to go to the next level because that's the point. You do this and you do that. But I think a lot of these problems, they, they don't really go away for the most part. Okay, that's well, not a bad thing, sense. though. That's just growth. I would, I would respectfully disagree just, just uh, to, to some degree. I would say there's a sort of a plateau um, because a human being is only capable of taking on so much. So if, so if a little bit of extra money means, oh, I can, I can have someone else you know, help out with locations, I think you're solving a little bit of problem. But I, see, I do see what you're saying oh, about yeah, yeah. as your budget goes up, your problems go up with it in many ways. I, I, I agree with that too. Well, I know that, um, I mean, obviously the program takes the micro-budget feature um, specifically in Alberta is a challenging pl place to be, a challenging place to start your career, but obviously a stepping stone to go further and hopefully to prove yourself and things like that. Um, certainly on behalf of the funders and the audience that are here, I'd certainly like to thank you for your passion, your creativity, your drive, your problem solving, your stick to itiveness to get these projects to the screen because all we want to do is get our Alberta stories to Alberta screens and hopefully out to the world. So before I open it up for questions, let's give these panelists a hand. And thank you. And I'd love to give a hand. I think all of us would agree to the Project Lab. It's, it's enabled some, some things that we really uh, would never have been able to make without you guys. So thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to Aaron Crawley here, who has been juggling kittens for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so let's leave the house. Yeah, let's get the house lights up and, and see if there's any questions out here. What school did you go to? Any recommendations for a young there are person? people out there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Backgrounds? Yeah, sure, of course. Uh, so I'm an engineer. I graduated from the University of Calgary in 2013 with a chemical engineering degree with a specialization in energy and environment. But I did, um, I joined the Calgary Society of Independent Filmmakers when I was 17 and I'm still a member. So my education was through uh, just doing workshops and being really thirsty at like casinos and stuff. I'm like, you make movies? Like, I want to be your friend. And I was like really weird for like about uh, like eight years. Um, but then uh, I accumulated like some friends who were nice to me. And we, yeah, then um, I was able to practice uh, my craft from the wage that I was making in engineering. And then once I got laid off, I I made the decision. It was a str I've been trying to make the transition for a while, but I made the transition two years ago. Uh, my background, video store geek skateboarder, uh, which led to me buying a camera to record my friend skateboarding, which led to us making short films and skits. So, I mean, my biggest advice for young filmmakers would be just to get your practice in when you can. Um, you have video cameras in your pockets. You can make a movie anytime you want. So just take a lot of time, make some cool friends that you enjoy making those movies with, and just make them so that you can continually, again, I'm gonna say this, fail in a safe environment. Because you are gonna fail, just make sure that not that many people are watching when you do fail. <laughs> uh, but then as far as organizations, I'm also the executive director of NUTV, which is the, yeah, shout out, uh, which is the campus television station, University of Calgary, and we offer free media production training to all of our members. Uh, we do mainly target students because students are the best and we wouldn't exist without them. But CSIF is also a lovely organization if you have a bit more cash. But yeah, just make them. Just write. Just make. If you're obsessed with them, just yeah. hone that obsession. It's like it. To me, it's still fun. Like I'm, tr I'm juggling three jobs here. I'm executive director of NUTV, lead program at Calgary Underground Film Festival, and a filmmaker in my own right. But all of them are extremely fun, and I do all of them with my friends. So it's like I just got lucky in that I just started with my friends early, and a lot of the friends I started with about 15 years ago, I'm still working with today, and we all just got better together. Uh, Matt will probably you'll. He's going last, so he's going to have the better thing to one-up me here. But uh, I'm going to say, uh, read your college. That's where uh, I went. Um, e the program is super flexible, uh, but what it did is in our last year, it's like a practicum. Um, we had a year off. We had free equipment. We had uh, crew and uh, actors, so we made a feature. Um, and that's what kind of started everything for us. We got fortunate. It, uh, um, played in theaters in Canada, and that led to just everything that's that's happened so far. Um, so there's some great people at that that program, um, and I, yeah, I completely echo what everyone's saying. It uh, just go out there and create and make stuff, and don't be scared of rejections with grants. Everyone's so terrified of putting a grant together and getting rejected, and the worst thing that happens is you have a finished grant with all the shit you need to do anyway. So it's uh, yeah, um, just do stuff. Don't don't wait for someone or something to come along um, to, to do something. 
So, um, Red Deer's better than State. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I went to State. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, I think I, I agree. Same with same with Cameron. I was I was hanging out with a couple of of my friends that worked on um, Abercadavers the other day, and I, and one of the questions was like, "What's your like golden piece of advice?" And I was like, "What like what do you guys think that it is?" And they're like, "Make something like good with good friends." So um, I think it's important to find friends. It's important to meet uh, to meet new people too. But I think uh, if like. If you're if you're in the industry and you're not having some kind of fun doing what you're doing or not enjoying your work, then you're you're losing out. So yeah, I mean, yeah. the old cliche is that if you put any um, if you put as much work as you put into trying to make movies in any other industry, you'd have a million dollars by now. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, my journey was uh, I'm from Edmonton, like uh, where Dylan lives now, um, and uh, I had a I had a uh, an idea that I would be an actor. Uh, so I went to the Victoria School of Performing and Visual Arts at the time, which was fantastic, but that's where I met a mentor named uh, Steve Ashworth, who uh, sort of said, you know, maybe you should think about the, the filmmaking side of things, the, the behind-the-camera stuff. Um, and he, he ended up t taking myself and a few other students to SAIT for a little visit, um, which was crazy. We, we took, like, a day trip up um, and, and saw SAIT, and I thought it would be great, and so I, I went there. Um, and then Cam and I worked at 724 Films, big big shot producers of Heartland and Winona Earp, and we, we, I'm sure we both learned a ton. Wild Roses, baby. And Wild Roses, yeah. <laughs> it's funny you should say that, because we're using a Porsche from Wild Roses. Nice. <laughs> One season. Anybody remember Wild Roses? No? All right. Very salacious. <laughs> uh, and then, um, you know, my partner, Scott, and I, we, uh, we've been working together on short films and web series and uh, kind of growing our way up to features, and we did a, a feature called In Plain View. Uh, and now um, Jones, and so um, that's kind of the nutshell version. But I will say that the Red Deer, you get a year of practicum. You get yeah, a full year. That's awesome. That is so. cool. That is cool. Say it is better, but that that's that's a <laughs> that is a, a very cool feature. Yeah. Can I just like shout out like my dream schools? Okay, Concordia has a great program. Ryerson is kicking out some amazing filmmakers in Canada right now, and like France, I'm like La Famille, La Famille, La Famille. I'm looking at someone, and he's not. Uh, help me out, but ben? that school is putting out some of the best French films right now from first-time directors. Like, I am so impressed. If you can get into that school, oh, I'm so jealous. Uh, where we're having a problem right now, we have a few projects on the go, and it's to come up with a number on what to sell it for or license it for afterwards. Any of you have you ever run into a how to crunch that number? to what to basically ask for is a fair, fair price. It's kind of sad out there right now. I'm going to be straight up. Uh, distribution market is saturated. Um, you kind of see what's offered, unless you got Nicolas Cage in the movie. Um, not, a lot of, not as many companies are giving minimum guarantees as they used to, so that was money you would get when you signed the contract, and that's the one you'd be able to negotiate. Um, for example, I'm going to be completely candid here. I made a promise on Facebook. Um, a film I produced three years ago played at the Toronto International Film Festival. Uh, feature film. Sounds great, right? Minimum guarantees, zero dollars. <laughs> How much have we made off the distribution of that film? Um, $1,800 perhaps. Oh. Uh, most Canadian movie ever made, though. I learned, we learned a lot of lessons about that. Um, but, I mean, I guess the, the price is based quite a bit on reviews, but also who's in it, right? It's like, yeah. think of yourself browsing through Google Play or... Um, on demand or, or whatever. If you've never heard of any of these movies, what's gonna be the deciding factor on that, right? Yeah. Uh, I would say uh, if you could work with, we work with sales agents who, who deal with that and know, like, know that, that market. Um, that way, especially if this, is this your first time on that side of, of doing that? Yeah. Um, if you, there are, there are some really reputable sales agents we can chat after, um, but Usually, uh, they'll, they know that, that world inside and out, and um, they can kind of do the negotiations uh, uh, on that side. So that's what I would suggest. The other quick, quick thing uh, that, we, that we've done in the past when we, uh, I, you know, I don't know TV, but um, whenever we just don't know an area, we, we try to find something similar to what we have made uh, on IMDb and literally call or email a producer with a similar project and, and, and just ask, hey, do you have five minutes to chat? I'm, I have no idea what I'm doing here. Uh, if you've got some experience with this. I'd and we did that with, with uh, some distributors who were interested in, in our previous film. We would call other filmmakers who had been yeah. uh, with that distributor and said, what was your experience like? So, 
What percentage of your budget was actually allocated to post-production? 30%? More than that, probably. Uh, so I don't, this math is too difficult, but we did, we did $280,000 budget and our post-production budget was like 46, 45,000. Zero? Zero. Uh, <laughs> uh, if I'm being completely honest, we're, we're focusing on production. First, it's terrifying, uh, but uh, uh, we just had to make the movie. We got we to make it happen. So um, I will go through another sort of fundraising phase uh, soon. Um, but uh, we, you know, we had a mentor who, who said, you just got to go for it. You know, it's, uh, you, you've got this opportunity. You got to take the opportunity and you know, cross the next bridge when you come to it. So if anybody's interested in investing in uh, a feature film... <laughs> Uh, ours was uh, about 20, 25 to 30 percent. I don't know exactly off my head, uh, but um, again, I think like uh, the numbers we're talking about, um, it just the more you scale up, it just kind of it changes. But usually, most people don't go in prepared enough for post. Mm -hmm. uh, on that side, we always underestimate it. Directors always like, oh, I'll just edit, no big deal, whatever. I'll just do that, or so, or you need something, you just that's where you take from because you're like, I just got to get through production. Um, so that's kind of the the curse of poor post-production they're always being taken from to, to make set. Uh, there's a great post-production grant in Alberta, though, that's been helping pay the hard-working post folks what they're actually worth. So, yeah, we were about 25 to 30 percent budgeted as well. So uh, on the subject of, of budgets, um, can you give a, a rough percentage of, of um, how much you receive from grants versus private investment? I can do that pretty easily. Uh... We put in 5% personal investment, and 30% was from a government tax break. So everybody who makes over a $50,000 project, if you're incorporated, you're eligible for the, is it called the Alberta Production Grant or screen? It's screen, screen based yeah. production grant. Now. Okay, so then everybody here is eligible for that of Alberta spend, and then uh, the remainder was a grant. So we were quite low. Like I think that a lot of people would uh, boost that with private investment, but anything's possible. Yeah, mine was uh, mostly private investment from uh, two of the greatest people in my life, one of which is here. I see you, Trev. Um, and then, yeah, tax credits and the generous support of the Film Center really took us to the finish line and made it a far more polished project. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of I'm sorry I didn't show a clip. I should take this time to say that. Uh, it's not too late. Uh, but my film, I don't want to. Sp I don't want to spoil anything. It's like, I, I let, Our film is extremely wild, and if I showed you anything, I feel it, may, it might ruin it or set your expectations uh, for a more a, a different film than it is. So I just want it to speak for itself. So I'm not even like mentioning this film on social media. Like sometimes I'll take the occasional sound edit suite photo, but it's like I don't really want to talk about it until I can have your money. If that makes sense. <laughs> How long ago did you shoot? Uh, Matt, uh, you dick, a year ago. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I was just going to say, I was just going to say, I feel like I've known about it for about a year, and today's the first time I've known anything about the plot. So, so Matt and I love each other. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a full year ago, and, I, and, and it's hard to not talk about it, but... Dude, I've got to film two years. We yeah. shot it, it's not out yet. But I'm just of the mindset, the, the more you talk about it, the, the more sick folks get of hearing about it, and they won't spend their money when it's available. It's a good point. You, there's momentum in the sort of marketing. It's yeah. a good point. Um, but I, it's cool. To, I'm excited. Now. This is the first I heard about what the premise was, so I'm excited. Okay, good. Thank you. Sorry I called you a dick. He's a lovely man. I, I like it's him very good. much. If I can, if you're interested in learning more about budgeting and stuff, the Hollywood Reporter's business section is like, sure, they're talking about things which are at a much higher scale than like micro budget, but honestly, like learning about how... Uh, how Marvel or like other like large productions get their financing is so helpful, and then it starts to help you think about um, okay, like what are what are the but what are the possibilities for myself? Like how can I scale back? Like actually re reading about how um, like Sama, which is this amazing Argentinian film, like there were like forty funders on that, for all government based. But even like seeing a project like that get made, you can see that there are alternative ways to make film. So I just. Yeah, like there's so much information just by being like on IndieWire or Hollywood Reporter or Variety or um, definitely like read that stuff. The best advice I got when I was like thirsty, <laughs> uh, trying to like learn how to do a telephone micro budget, which was actually for your project. Um, Lauren Davis said, 
subscribed to the Hollywood, Rep Hollywood Reporter for everything. And I was like, but I'm like just a student in Alberta. What could that teach me? And I've learned so much from reading every single article that comes through there. Uh, we had, uh, well, well, God, uh, it was, we had uh, 200 in uh, pre-sales, um, and then the rest was uh, small, 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 small private part, and then we had uh, the SPGA and uh, some development money, and then uh, Calgary, uh, uh, our project-led money. Uh, yeah, ours is like 50-50 tax credits and, and then private funding. Um, I, I can I can give more detail uh, directly, but off the off the top of my head, yeah, I I, I would say it's a yeah, it's a combination of um, I would say maybe twenty percent private, and then it's tax credit SPG uh, project lab and out of our own pocket too. But but yeah, anytime if you want to email, I'll I'll happy to share. I'm, I'm guessing I've been making short films or feature films for uh, some time. What's one common sense stupid how did I not see this sooner mistake that we can hopefully avoid making ourselves. Good question, Sam. Um, Thank you, Cameron. <laughs> uh, celebrating being tired and busy. Uh, I don't know what it is about North American culture, but we love to become too occupied and brag about how occupied we are. When in which that interferes with the creative process. Um, I, I really wish I just had given myself more time in my earlier work to appreciate what I was doing reflect on why I was doing it and take those lessons with me. And in order to give yourself time to reflect, you need rest. Uh, you need to sleep, you need to keep your mind fresh. So uh, when I was coming up, a lot of folks would brag, oh man, I didn't even get a single wink of sleep last night in between uh, day four and day five, as though it was cool. It ain't cool to be tired. It's like your movie's gonna not be as good. Your decision-making skills aren't gonna be as sharp. So. Just, it could be unsafe. Like, it's extremely unsafe. More folks die in car accidents from being too tired than they do from drunk driving. So I'm, I, I am a strong supporter of rest, especially if you're the director. Uh, producers don't need to rest. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if we get our sleep in the bar. That's right. But it's like if you want your decision-making skills to be on point and you want the movie to be as good as possible, give yourself time to reflect on why you're doing it instead of just the act of doing it. Because everybody looks to the director for the answer as to what needs to be done next. You should make sure that that's a good answer and not just something you pulled out of your butt because you just wanted to move on to the next shot. I'd say going into a project, knowing what you actually want from it, um, one of the things that I it's taken me a long time to, to realize is if it is to get an agent, that's what the job is. If it's to get into a festival, uh, that's what it's for. Um, I, I used to just make films for the sake of making it, but uh, the problem at the end, uh, I didn't have any satisfaction because I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. It was just like, it just I made it, but I didn't know if it was for a learning experience, if it was just to tell a story. Um, so I was often frustrated with uh, just not having... Um, some sort of satisfaction at the end of it. So uh, the biggest thing, uh, yeah, I've learned is making the projects and just knowing what I want them to do or what the goal is behind them so that there's some sort of uh, achievability in them. Like we talked about your film that, at TIFF. Everyone's like, I want to get my film in TIFF. That's not always going to be the biggest payout if you're trying to grow or make money or get investors. It works in one way. Um, and vice versa, if you don't make a festival movie, um, it can be, you're like, I want to get into TIFF, and your film is more of a pop culture thing. So um, really understanding what you want the project to do. Um, yeah. I think, for me, um, auteur theory is only possible because you have a sick team of people around you. But it's a balance. You don't want to be delegating too much of your vision to other people. So it's a balance between asking other people to be the very best for your project and being respectful of that, but also, like, you want to be confident in what you're doing. So for me in post-production, that was like a big learning curve. Like I cannot do everything, right? But I think oftentimes people get into filmmaking because they think like, I'm a genius, I'm so smart. Like I love Francis Ford Coppola, like he's the best, but like he had a team. No, seriously, like he had a team of people helping him make Apocalypse Now a beautiful film. So I think like, Balancing, like you have to be ego driven and you have to be obsessed with it, but also like listen to the people around you and respect that. Um, I think the biggest uh, thing is like understanding how much of yourself your 
putting into a project. Um, I think when you go into into a project, oftentimes you don't realize like this is going to take like up ninety percent of my life for the next six months. Um, and if you aren't like prepared for that or whatever, then um, it can really like blindside you. I think like temper your expectations and figure out like how much money like am I going to make from this? How much like time am I going to lose on this? Um, and like how do I continue to live off that? I guess. Those are all I think better and more important answers than this one. But so I, so I would say uh, you have to be a shameless marketer. Um, you you really have to be your own um, you know PR machine. And uh, I think I talked with some filmmakers who are like, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't want people to think I'm, you know, bragging or talking about my film all the time. And and you, I, for me, it's like I, I don't care. If you don't like me, that's fine. You can you can unfollow. You don't have to. You don't have to. You can block me. But I, you have to build your audience. You have to come with an audience when you get to time time to sell. Um, and a short film is a great way to practice that and, and find ways that work. Um, and I might segue us out by saying. Check out Jones and on Facebook, <laughs> <laughs> Jones and Movie on Twitter, and Jones and Movie on Instagram as well. <laughs> okay. And I encourage all of us to share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, some sh shameless marketing. There's nothing uh, wrong with that. Uh, Go ahead. Okay. I mean, if we're yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> you got it. You got it. Great. Uh, well, yeah, Abrick Average is on uh, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. That's probably our go-to. Um, our social media guy is Griffin Cork, and he's great, and he's posting like every day. So, um, yeah, is. check him out. I, I do think, though, like, yes, you want to market your film, but this is the most selfish period of your life to make a micro budget. Everything that you do, you it's like um, you are the most, you have the most gravitational force of like the entire world. That's what it feels like. A little humility can go a long way when people are like try, there to support you, and they're not getting paid anything either. So there is a balance between, I am so important, but you're also, like for a producer or for anybody, it's like, you're also on this journey with me. So I think you have to appreciate those people. And as a leader, if you do want to be the auteur everyone's talking about, you have to remember that you want to be the leader that everybody wants. wants. So that's somebody who, feel, who like appreciates other people. And yeah, that's, that's also what I think. Thank you, and that's an excellent segue for me to thank the people that have sponsored the Project Lab all along. So I do want to absolutely thank our partner on this and sponsor the Government of Alberta and Alberta Film, uh, City of Calgary in their support for uh, the Calgary Film Centre, and the Creative Industries team at Calgary Economic Development who support us every day. So thank you to everyone. <laughs>